Good morning, everyone. Um, today's passage is 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. And it goes like this. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, who are loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jans and Jambres oppose Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not go very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. I'll passage this because it seems to be looking forward predicting that there will be terrible times in the last days. But then Paul instructs Timothy to have nothing to do with these God, ungodly people, implying it's very much in the present, which suggests that these are ungodly people being encountered now rather in some future last days. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the theory that many scholars have that the pastoral epistles were not written by Paul, but it's written by a fan of Paul. And this is one of those passages that gives weight to the idea. It makes more sense as a general letter from a church leader giving their views on the future than a personal letter from one church leader to another. But regardless of context and when the writer thought the last days were, these things, words ring true. In the first century, there were people who were lovers of themselves, lovers of money and boastful. And now many people are treacherous, conceited and lovers of pleasure. I think he's, he's describing a way lots of people are and always have been. Um, we're instructed to stay away from this sort of people. And I suppose my question when I read this was, does that contradict the example of Jesus who sought out sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, and when he had dinner with them, much to the shock of people who thought themselves religious and righteous? I don't think there is a contradiction here because the people Jesus sought out may have been doing stuff that was wrong, but what often they were victims themselves and they wanted to be with Jesus and were willing to listen and change. And I think Paul is talking here about people who are often in positions of power and who are unwilling to listen and unwilling to change. They're so wrapped up in themselves and their own agenda and getting what they want that they've got no room for Jesus or are only willing to engage with him on a very, very superficial level. And Paul is saying, don't get sucked into the life of these sort of people and their way of living. And because that can easily happen. And this sort of behavior he talks about is corrosive. It eats away at people's lives and the way they live. And it's not just weak-willed women that are vulnerable to this sort of thing, it's weak-willed men too. So I think this is a passage that is a challenge for us. Is the company we keep, our friendships, healthy? Do we hang out with people who are good for our souls, who are loving, who nourish us? And they need not necessarily be Christians or people whose way of life wears our reserves of goodness down. 
It's also a very us and them passage. It assumes that those people with these bad qualities are not Christians. But I think we have to acknowledge that in the past, the church has had quite a lot of people in it who have been boastful, lovers of money, brutal and abusive, and a whole load of other bad things. And if we are honest with ourselves, at times we can be some of these things ourselves. So I think this passage is one of those ones where we ought to look at it and ask ourselves honestly, have I a tendency or can I be any of these things in the long list of bad news? And what do I need to do about it? And self-knowledge, the ability to look at ourselves honestly and recognize our weaknesses, as well as our strength, is a valuable gift. If we look at this list, how do we measure up? Are we ever unforgiving or without love or conceited or lacking self-control or loves of pleasure? I know I don't get full marks on these. And it's good to, to use a passage like this to take stock and think, how do I need to change? It's also good to think about it with a trusted friend who can be honest when necessary and also encouraging when needed. Such friends are hard to come by because being really honest takes a lot of courage and trust. And I think there's something we should treasure and search out. And that is all I have for you today.